This video is brought to you by Atlas VPN. Let's do a test together. In a second, I'll be asking you to imagine a color. Just don't think about it too much. Just say the first color that comes to your mind, although there is some context to it. Let's go. If I were to ask you, what color is bronze? And you can't just say bronze is bronze. You have to pick a color. What color would you pick? I'll give you five seconds. Okay, so did you say green, red, brown, yellow? Please leave a comment down below with the color you picked so I can have a percentage-based statistical analysis to see if, in fact, the title of this video is right. Back to us. All right, which answer is the correct one? Well, have a seat. Hello Nobu ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and on this series we talk about the popular views of the past and correct them when they are wrong. And we do that through the material evidence, history, ancient languages, science and logic. In the previous episode we discussed polychromy in the classical period, specifically talking about statuary and architecture, you'll find a link in the description below, check it out. Today we're talking bronze. So bronze is an essential element of our imagination when we think of Spartan warriors, Athenians, Roman Republican military, also statues, we think of shields, weapons, swords, spears. But what color is it? Now, bronze, depending on whether it's modern, it's ancient, what it was used for, in what condition it is, may be observed in all of the four different colors that were mentioned during the test. But by examining your answers, we can see which type of bronze you have most likely been exposed to in your personal experience. In reality, however, bronze is a variety of color shades that are dependent on alloy composition and particularly on the percentage of tin present. And that's for tin bronze, we're not even talking about arsenical bronze, the more ancient type, because I've already talked about it on this video. One more link. So, you have classical bronze, modern bronze, commercial bronze, architectural bronze, aluminium bronze, tin bronze, arsenical bronze, beryllium bronze, silver bronze, silicon bronze, chrome bronze, cadmium bronze, zirconium bronze, titanium bronze, okay, basically bronze is chocolate. Doesn't matter what you put in it, it's still chocolate. I could go for some chocolate right now. Let's review your answers. If your answer was green or bluish green, then most likely the image you have in your mind is connected to material goods in museums, as the green bluish look is what happens when bronze develops a patina over time which protects it from corrosion. Either that or you're an OG player like me and you were thinking about the game Ghouls and Ghosts. Which I mean, the guy is a medieval knight, so the armor would have been ancient for him, so it does make sense that he was in this state. I'm telling you, all games did it right. If your answer was brown, then probably your connection to bronze is that of trophies or the three medals in the Olympics, where it usually has that kind of more brownish hue, doesn't it? And on that note, what are Olympic medals made of? Because I mean, yes, they're called silver medal, gold medal, bronze medal, but my silver play button that I got from YouTube for reaching 100,000 subscribers, well, it is not made of silver. You thought they were gonna give silver to me? That thing is 92% nickel, 5% carbon, and only 2.5% zinc. No silver there. Well, the gold play button, the one you get at 1 million subscribers, at least it's gold-plated brass. So, I mean, subscribe. Back to the Olympics. The gold medal only contain about 6 grams of gold. Otherwise, at least 92.5% is made from silver. Fan fact, the last fully gold medal given out dates back to 1912. So, good gold times, I guess. The silver medal, however, is made from 100% silver. The bronze medal, wait for it is made of red brass, which is 95% copper and 5% zinc. You lied to me! Bronze metal! And it's not bronze! You don't lie to a Sicilian, you know? I'm out of here. If you said reddish brown, then it's possible that you are a historical reenactor and you're familiar with the kind of gear that you can get made of bronze, like for example this Montefortino helmet. Or maybe you're collecting metal cubes, like me, in which case we both need professional help. But what if your answer is actually yellow? If your answer was yellow, then it means you are more familiar with both high-end museum quality replicas of classical period, or perhaps you've seen a lot of images from history and archaeology books where usually bronze is represented with this almost gold hue. Did you ever notice that? Did you? Either that, or you play video games such as Assassin's Creed or Conan Exile, where bronze is exactly that. Yellow. Look at that, I'm absolutely in love with bronze fine metal work. I mean, give me a bronze sword over any sports car. Am I weird? 
Now, when it comes to the look of bronze in the classical age, yellow bronze would have been more common for weapons and armor, particularly if compared with more modern bronze, probably closer to what today we would call yellow bronze, 92% copper, 8% tin. Well done, game developers. But the reality is that there isn't one size fits all answer, and it would be a very much of a case by case scenario, as the physical and mechanical properties of the bronze, as well as its surface color, would evolve and change according to its composition, and the proportions of copper and tin varied widely, as demonstrated by the data accrued through hundreds and hundreds of period specimens through physiochemical analyses based on archaeometric methodologies such as XRF spectrometry and XRF imaging in order to establish the chemical composition of ancient alloys. Now, if you're like me and you like to surf the internet looking for interesting historical information, it's a great idea to do it in safety, which is why you should totally use today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. A VPN is a virtual private network that makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel, and this way it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, it hides your IP address and online activities. Atlas VPN is a great choice because it was developed by cyber security specialists, and among other things, it gives you access to the data breach monitor, which is a security feature designed to track any data breaches related to your online account, automatically scanning any leaked information. But another add-on through Atlas VPN is the fact that you can use Netflix from any countries, regardless of where you are. So let's say that you wanted to watch a show that is only available in the UK, but you live in America. No problem, just change your country through the VPN and boom, access granted. I always have Atlas VPN active on my machines and that is because one account lets you use multiple devices. I personally really like Atlas VPN not only because it's a great choice but also because it's really affordable and that links to today's special offer. The summer deal for protection that's $1.79 a month for three years plus four months for free. So if you've been considering getting a VPN but you weren't sure about the prices then now is the time. And don't forget to click the link in the description. That's $1.79 a month for three years plus four months for free. Keep in mind that this is a time limited offer, so be quick and click the link in the description. And big thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring my video. Goodness gracious if that wasn't a trip. But now I'd like to focus a little more on this patina that forms in bronze, and I'll tell you also a fun fact you might not know that has to do with the United States of America. Hint, the city of New York. But first things first, let's talk helmets. Now, differently from rust, which occurs in iron and steel, nobody wants that, bronze patinas can be desirable. One, because they're protected from further corrosion, usually. Two, because they are aesthetically pleasing. Sir Arthur, don't you dare polish that armor. Don't, don't touch it, don't, just, I'm gonna. Literally, this bronze thing is really growing on me. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna buy a unit of undead from Warhammer Fantasy. I'm gonna paint all of their armor and metal bronze. Just kidding, I've already done that. So, patinas can result because of time and atmospheric conditions, or they can be intentional. For example, the writer Plutarch tells us that the statue of the Spartan admiral in Delphi was entirely covered by a blue-looking patina. Imagine how beautiful that must have been. Now, if you're thinking, wow, I wish I had the money to go to Greece so I could see one of these statues with a full-on patina, well, you don't need to go to Greece. Have you ever been to New York City? If the answer is yes, I live in Manhattan, you muppet, then you have seen one. The Statue of Liberty. You see that green color? Well, that's because the statue is entirely made of metal and it's covered in a patina. That is not its original color. So what did it look like? I'll show you. Just wait a second. The statue is made of 250,000 pounds of steel and 62,000 pounds of copper. The steel being the skeleton, the copper being the sheets that actually create the outside. Wow, 62,000 pounds of copper. Well, I have no idea what that means because I don't understand Imperial. So uh, kilograms, please. The copper sheets that form the outside of the statue are actually the thickness of two US cents, and originally it looked like this. That does look great too, but to be honest I like it more green. So yay for patinas. That is because the air and water reacted with the copper metal and resulted in oxidation. This oxidation created a layer of patina, a copper carbonate. Now before we dive into the actual technical side of this video, yeah I know, there is something else we need to say. You know when you go to a museum, or perhaps you're reading a book, and it tells you this item is made of bronze? Well, sometimes that's not even true. Let me give you a few examples. 
First of all, most copper coins were actually bronze, typically with a 4% tin and a 1% zinc. So if you're a Dungeons & Dragons DM and you've got your, your gold, you've got your silver, you've got your copper, then most likely those are bronze too. If the fantasy world works a bit like ours, otherwise just make them copper. Even though bell metal, which is characterized by its sonorous quality when struck, is a bronze with a high tin content, usually 20-25%, some statuary bronze with a tin content of less than 10% and an admixture of zinc and lead is technically a brass. Not always, but sometimes. The metal of the 12th century English Gloucester candlestick is a bronze containing a mixture of, get ready, copper, zinc, tin, lead, nickel, iron, antimony, arsenic, and an unusually large amount of silver, between 22.5% in the base and 5.76% in the pan below the candle. The proportions of these constituents really suggest that this was a hoard of coins, that you just put them together, melt them, and created a candle holder. But does it still qualify as bronze? Is that like, what, Frankenstein bronze? The 13th century Benin bronzes are in fact brasses. And to add insult to injury, since nomenclature hasn't been kind to us, there is a metal that was a mystery up to not so long ago that was used by the Romans and the Greeks called oricalcum. And now we know that it's some kind of high quality brass, but the thing is that the original name actually means mountain copper. So it's called mountain copper, they thought it was bronze, but it was actually high quality brass. And then there are the orcs in Skyrim. <sighs> The colors that you may obtain from all of these different alloys cover a wide spectrum. Green, blue, red, yellow, brown, black. To be more precise, we could say that a system of color matching is required in order to discuss color in three dimensions, with the three components being hue, value for lightness, and chroma for color strength. The inclusion of lead doesn't seem to influence the final result when it comes to the color of the alloy that is achieved, in the sense that it only seems to darken the color a little bit. What really makes the difference is the quantity of tin. A low quantity of tin will result into a redder bronze, and a high quantity of tin will result into a yellow bronze usually between the 9 to 15 percent, will result in a yellow bronze. Now, of course, looking at extant examples is a great way to have an indication or an idea of what these elements look like, and even when they are fully covered in a patina, you can still sometimes see a little bit of what the base color underneath it was in ancient times, and of course you have to imagine it probably polished in a more lustrous form. However, the appreciation and identification of the original chromatic varieties and qualities really is difficult because it's connected with how, for example, a patina was formed. For instance, the level and variety of corrosion and the reaction that the metal had to the environment mostly depends on how these specimens were preserved. For instance, under partially aerobic conditions, tin tends to react by forming an oxide sulfate. On the other side of the spectrum, it appears that tin and its oxidation in an anaerobic environment produces a different type of reaction based on cassarite because of the similar redox potential. Not to mention that even the preservation of its original shape is based on the epitaxial relationship between the surface of the bronze and its corrosion products as these are usually formed by epitactic transformations. But even if we were to identify the original colors of both weapons, armor, but even furniture, considering all the different types of bronze that were used for furniture in ancient Rome and ancient Greece, we have to consider the possibility of different varieties of finish. Something could be polished to a lustrous, slightly opaque or full-on mirror polish. Some armor was fully gilded, whereas some other times there was some gold inlay happening. Last but not least, we also have just decoration on armor. And even though some of the earliest decorated armor was produced during the Celtic Bronze Age, we have some incredible examples both in ancient Rome and ancient Greece. And even though plain examples do exist, many helmets were decorated with engraving and embossing. Now, did you know that bronze patinas can play with the light? Some fine translucent patina let in light and reflect upon contact with the surface of the bronze. Other more opaque patinas do not reflect the light and make the surface, well, matte. So tin is usually added to improve the castability of the alloy by lowering the melting point and hardening bronze as a result. Lead can also be added to increase the castability, although usually it's not necessary to exceed 5%, otherwise it might embrittle the alloy, due to what is called the liquation phenomenon. And since we are talking about so many different kinds of bronze, I need to mention Corinthian bronze, which was a mixture of copper, silver and even some gold. 
Corinthian bronze without a patina seems to have some sort of reddish color, but it was presumably patinated in antiquity to achieve different color variations, from golden to black. Okay, Noble Ones, I think that this is enough for this discussion on what bronze would have looked like in ancient times. If you liked it, please leave a comment, give me a like, and share this video with your friends, family, and your dog and your cat. As always, don't forget to click the link in the description below to take advantage of the amazing offer by Atlas VPN. Thank you very much for watching, and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.